Good morning, good afternoon, good evening, wherever you are in the world. I'm Nicolas Veron. It's my honor to introduce this uh, session of the financial statement series at the Peterson Institute. Particular honor because we have two extremely distinguished speakers today uh, to discuss the uh, uh, long-term consequences, in a way, of the uh, regional bank crisis of uh, a year ago in the U.S. and uh, structural developments in the U.S. financial sector. Sheila Baer studied initially at the University of Kansas, uh, bachelor's degree in philosophy and a law degree in 1978. Uh, she uh, uh, worked for the U.S. Department of Health, um, Education and Welfare. Uh, and then for the uh, Senate Majority Leader, Bob Dole, uh, for most of the 1980s, he was then commissioner and acting chair of the Commodities Future Trading Commission, the CFTC, in the early 90s. Uh, she uh, then had a number of uh, more distinguished positions in the public and the private sector. She was senior vice president for government relations of the New York Stock Exchange uh, in the late 90s, then assistant secretary for financial institutions at the U.S. Treasury in the early 2000s during the Bush administration. She then became a professor of financial regulatory policy at the Eisenberg School of Management at the University of Massachusetts Amherst from 2002 to 2006, and then uh, was appointed uh, chair of the FDIC from 2006 to 2011, which of course encompassed uh, the great financial crisis. Uh, she had a major impact on the management of that crisis, and also there is a, a side product of it, which is her best-selling book, uh, Bull by the Horns, Fighting to Save Mainstream from Wall Street and Wall Street from Itself, uh, which really uh, defined many aspects of the agenda for financial uh, reform in the ensuing years. Uh, after leaving the FDIC in 2011, uh, Sheila Baer became senior advisor for the Pew Charitable Trust. She's the chair emerita of the Systemic Risk Council, which is a joint venture of the Pew Charitable Trust with the CFA Institute. Uh, she's served on a number of corporate and nonprofit boards at Thomson Reuters, at Santander, at uh, in, uh, Industrial and Commercial Bank of China in the late 2010s. Um, she's been president of Washington College in the mid-2010s. Uh, she was also uh, on the board and at some point the chair of Fannie Mae more recently in the early uh, 2020s uh, on the board of uh, the Volcker Alliance, the Rand Corporation, the National Women's Law Center. I won't be able to mention them all, but she's <laughs> a trustee of the Economist for Peace and Security, so Things that resonates with us at the Peterson Institute, sadly, uh, these uh, in these days. I should also mention um, two or three more things. Um, Sheila Bear writes children's book about financial education, uh, and uh, I cannot resist mentioning some of the titles. You can also see some of them on her shelves. Bullies of Wall Street, Billy the Borrowing Blue-Footed Booby, and Princess Persephone Loses the Castle, which is my favorite. Uh, she also, uh, I think, has to be mentioned, uh, was ranked in 2008 and 2009 by Ford magazine as the second uh, most powerful woman in the world, uh, just behind Angela Merkel, the Chancellor of Germany. Uh, and last but not least, she was the second speaker in the OLK lecture on ethics and economics at the Peterson Institute back in May 2016. Uh, thanks again uh, for being with us. Uh, Graham Steele uh, studied at the uh, University of Rochester and at George Washington University Law School, where he graduated in 2006. Uh, he was public policy counsel at Public Citizens, a Washington-based nonprofit. And then in 2010, he joined the staff of Senator Sherrod Brown. He uh, then became minority chief counsel for the Committee on Banking, Housing, and Urban Affairs uh, at the Senate. In 2017, uh, 2018, he worked at the San Francisco Fed, and then he joined the faculty of the Graduate School of Business at Stanford University. He was also the director of the Corporations and Society Initiative at Stanford, uh, also uh, worked for the Omidyar Network as a senior advisor, uh, also a senior fellow at the um, American Economic Liberties Project. And in 2021, uh, he became Assistant Secretary for Financial Institutions at the U.S. Treasury, which by happenstance, 20 years later, was the exact same job that uh, Sheila Baer had had uh, back in the early 2000s. Uh, so same office, I guess, in the Treasury building. Uh, 
different circumstances, to be sure. Uh, and uh, Graham uh, was in that um, uh, storied office until January this year, uh, when he left the Treasury and is now a fellow at the Roosevelt Institute. With that, Sheila, over to you. Okay, great. Well, that was that was a very kind introduction. Thank you very much. Um, I, I was asked to specifically talk about the risk of a barbell banking system, so I thought I would focus uh, primarily on that because I do think we uh, our, the, our future banking structure may well uh, turn into a barbell. I'm very concerned about regional banks. I think they're very, very important to uh, having a competitive banking system. They're really the only you know uh, threat of competition uh, to the very largest uh, banks. Uh, we do have an issue of bank concentration uh, in the U.S., but that's that's at the mega bank level. It's not at the regional bank level. And um, I do think we need to encourage, not discourage, M&A activity. Um, and uh, we also need to do something among the regionals. And I think we also need to do something to help them stabilize their uninsured deposits. And if we don't do that, and right now we're not doing that, um, I think many are not going to survive. Let's start with uninsured deposits. That was a front and center issue, obviously, with the with the failures of last spring, particularly at SVP. Most regional banks, I want to reemphasize, are healthy and stable. I think the whole sector is being tainted somewhat by the media. It should not be. But they are all exposed to the risk of uninsured deposit runs. And there's nothing new about this. In times of stress, when you have banks starting to fail, it's going to cause uninsured deposits to run to the, the mega banks, the too big to fail banks, or money market funds from any bank that's viewed as small enough to fail. And this is why this was happening during the great financial crisis, which is why we uh, use the systemic risk exception to institute the temporary transaction account guarantee program or TAG. It was highly successful in stabilizing these deposits or the ones we cared about, which were the transaction accounts, which by definition will almost always be uh, above the uninsured deposit limits, the insured deposit limits. And unfortunately, the FDIC does not have that authority now, so Congress needs to reinstate it. And uh, it is frustrating to me is that they have not, and it's frustrating to me that the Biden administration has saw fit not to even ask for it, uh, which uh, for various reasons which I do not find persuasive. I think there is some sense that FRB, uh, Federal Reserve Bank lending facilities, can somehow uh, uh, substitute for expanded deposit guarantees in time of stress. Uh, they cannot. Uh, they can certainly make uh, liquidity more accessible, but they cannot prevent failures and they cannot prevent the risk of contagion if we do have more bank failures. If anything, Fed lending uh, could make contagion risk worse because the sophisticated uninsured depositors will understand that a bank that's doing a lot of heavily collateralized borrowing from the Fed or any place sells, all of that collateral is going to the lender and it's not available to the FDIC if the bank fails. So that's going to increase the losses upon failure, reducing the amount of recoveries that an uninsured depositor would be able to uh, be able to have. So I, I, I do think uh, this is not I, I applaud what the Fed's doing to you know make the discount window OK to use and allow banks to preposition capital so they know exactly the terms um, and the haircuts that will be imposed. But this is not going to substitute for an expanded uninsured deposit guarantee. Uh, I'm also very uh, concerned about current efforts to uh, discourage M&A activity among regional banks. Uh, we should be doing just the opposite. I mean, if we wanna prevent regional failures, we should be encouraging the healthy ones to buy the weaker ones uh, and, and not, the opposite, uh, not the opposite direction, which is what we're doing. Um, you know, look, this is what happens when, you know, when things get tense, that's proverbial, the folks are swimming naked, the guy goes, yeah, you see who they are. And the healthy ones, the one with the bathing suits should be able to, to pick up the, the weak ones. That's kind of the way markets work. And it can be a very much better solution uh, to letting the bank fail and having the FDIC have to re resolve it. So again, I think blocking mergers right now are discouraging them, sending strong signals that they're not going to be approved is absolutely uh, the, the wrong direction. Uh, we are we, sh we, we should be going the other way and encouraging it. Um, you also wanted to, uh, I think you had asked that I would talk a little bit about the supervisory issues that were raised uh, last by the issues last spring. Again, I want to emphasize I have confidence in the regional banking sector. I'm worried about their uninsured deposits, but overall, I think they're managing the risk well. But there are a handful that are struggling. There's no doubt about it. And uh, a robust supervisory process can help reduce the failures. Obviously, the first strategy should always be to, to, to prevent failures. 
uh, and we need to be prepared to resolve them if they do fail. But I, it's not clear to me that the uh, supervised response to last year's uh, problems have been uh, particular, uh, completely on target. And we've seen you know, continuing problems most recently with New York Community Bank. So to their credit, the Fed and the FDIC did own up to their supervisory uh, opportunities for improvement, shall we say, in the oversight of, of Signature in Silicon Valley and First Republic. But I really think the OCC should do the same with its uh, oversight of New York Community Bank. Uh, it's apparent now we know that this bank's uh, risk management was very weak. It was dramatically under-reserved uh, for its commercial real estate exposures. Yet, you know, in the past few years, the OCC uh, approved it, that should have been caught through the regular supervisory process, but it wasn't. Not only that, but the OCC approved uh, its Flagstar acquisition, which dramatically increased the size of the bank. It's been reported that the FDIC, which had been the primary regulator of the New York Community Bank, uh, did not think that was wise. Uh, it was a you know classic uh, charter conversion to, to get that deal done, which the OCC facilitated. And then the OCC uh, approved uh, NYSCB to, to bid on signature assets, and, and the FDIC agreed to that. But again, I'm scratching my head on that. I, I, I do think we need a review of, of what was going on there. You know, if the idea was that somehow propping two drunks together, right, <laughs> signature and, uh, and uh, New York community was going to make them better, that, that doesn't work. You know, propping two drunks uh, against each other does not keep them up, right? That's been tried and, and it's a failed strategy. And I hope that's not how regulators are thinking about things these days. It's also unfair to the, the healthy banks that are in the, uh, the bidding process. Um, again, I think regulators have done a really good job of reviewing the adequacy of reserves against uh, CRE exposures. That's an issue with the, with the very largest banks as well. You, the numbers are there are public. Uh, most of them are uh, are under-reserved on their CRE exposures. Uh, but I'm not sure other lessons have been fully addressed. Uh, it's not clear to me examiners have the flexibility that they need. Have they been empowered to focus on the things that matter at those banks and take prompt action? Do they still have these layers of bureaucratic review? Which again was, was identified in the, uh, the Fed and FDIC self-assessments. And then we still have a fixed liquidity and capital stress testing process and their treatment of, of government issued and government backed securities is, is uh, you know, lower zero risk and highly liquid. That's just not the case when interest rates rise. Uh, and the, the sad fact is SVB failed because it was grossly mismanaged, but those stress tests would not have prevented the failure because of the, the generous treatment of, of the securities, the government backed securities that SVB had, had, had filed into. So. That needs to be fixed. It hasn't been fixed. So I would just say in conclusion, I think regional banks are being squeezed. Um, they're having to fight to keep their uninsured deposits. They're having to pay up. This is a this is a problem, the distortion with the too big to fail perception, which we have not teased out of the system. You know, nobody thinks that JP Morgan Chase is going to go down or City or B of A. They're all assuming that the, the government is going to bail them out no matter what. So that's where they go, or they go to money market funds, uh, which again have been enabled by two bailouts from the Fed, as well as they've significantly benefited from access to the ONRRP um, facilities that the Fed set up. Thank goodness usage of that is, is declining. But you know that's the economic equivalent of, of a reserve account at the Fed without any of the regulation that we impose on banks for those types of uh, government safety nets. So uh, I do think this has exacerbated the problem, the competitiveness of, of the ability of the regional banks to keep their uninsureds. And, uh, you know, we don't want a system that's even more dominated by the mega banks. And if we ignore these problems, the regional sector is going to shrink. A lot, of them, a lot of them may not survive, even healthy ones. And uh, I do think this requires an, an urgent uh, focus and priority. And again, it just seems to me like the policy response is going in the, uh, in the opposite direction. Uh, regional banks are really important for small, medium-sized businesses, governments, local governments, nonprofits. They use those regional banks. And if, if they fade away, you know, the options are going to be go to the mega banks, which are probably going to be more expensive. They're going to give less personal attention. Fortunately, with the smaller banks, community banks, it's less of an issue because of their heavy reliance on insured deposits. But the regional banks are challenged right now. And I think that deserves uh, more attention than it's getting. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, you referred to the barbell distribution uh, just for clarification. That means that you would have a number of small banks, community banks. Well, I, 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 I don't of... want that. <laughs> yeah, I don't want that. It's just, it just, yeah. just for clarification of the expression. Yeah, so, I think so we're going to have the, the systemically, you know, and... 
lot. Yes. So I'm talking about the GSIBs on one end, community banks on the other hand, and, and not much in the middle. I think that that's the direction we're going. And some people like that. You know, I've heard people in senior levels of government over the decades say uh, they, they like the fact you know, just got a handful of really big banks. They like the Canadian system. Uh, so I think there's some disadvantages of that, but I get it. You know, but if that's the policy objective, then I think people should be open and public about that. Thanks. And of course, GSIBs is global uh, systemically important banks. Right. Uh, Graham. Yes, thank you. Okay, well, thanks. Uh, and thanks, Sheila, for that uh, helpful introduction here. So I want to start by agreeing with Sheila that I think the, our U.S. economy benefits from this unique and broad and diverse banking system that we have here that is, that is different from a lot of uh, other countries, the, the shapes uh, and contours of their banking systems. Um, and, you know, some of these issues have been a little bit personal for me because I live out here in California. I live in the Bay Area. Uh, and last year, I participated in a roundtable at the Rock Center for Social Governance at Stanford Law School right after SVB failed, where I heard firsthand about the impact of SVB's failure of depositors, its business customers, and the communities right here in my backyard in Northern California. And, you know, it was encouraging that a buyer emerged shortly after SVB's failure. But what I heard was that the industries and communities for which SVB served as an important source of financial services still experienced meaningful both short-term and long-term disruptions as part of that process. And I want to agree with Sheila again that I think the banks that serve specific regions and industries provide higher touch, more customized products and services than the global systemically important banks or GSIBs. Um, and that without regional banks, there may be less innovation, developing novel or customized products for some of these uh, niche industries for areas that underwriting and other business processes can take longer, become more cumbersome for customers. So as a result, certain parts uh, of the startup and small business ecosystem receive less attention and by extension, they get less capital to grow and expand. So uh, I agree in principle, policymakers need to ensure we have a robust mix of community, mid-sized and regional banks. And to my mind, that needs to start with updating the way that policymakers understand the relationship between regulation, competition, financial stability and economic growth. And I remember that beginning in 2017, um, there was this prevailing argument that regulations had to be rolled back uh, in order to ensure that regional banks could be competitive. Um, but I, as I think history has shown us repeatedly, strong regulations and consumer protection are not anathema to a prosperous economy. They're actually vital to ensuring a financial system is a, is a source of stability and growth and that banks of all sizes, small, mid-size, regional, can remain competitive over the longer term, not just in the short term. So I think we need to make the capital, liquidity, and resolution frameworks that apply to banks more progressive in order to maintain that competition. More, competitive, more progressive capital requirements in particular help to slow rapid and unfettered growth like we saw at SVB, Signature, First Republic, and some of these other banks without deterring healthy organic growth at the same time. Uh, I also think we need a belt and suspenders approach to capital regulation that uses both risk sensitive and risk insensitive measures. We've seen repeatedly that markets, when stresses start to happen, they tend to look to simple, credible, and comparable measurements to assess a bank solvency and look through some of these more complicated measurements. So I think really thinking about how to simple, simplify and clarify the capital rules will keep banks on stable footing during these market downturns and that confidence then doesn't get undermined. And I think the agencies have actually had some recent proposals on capital specifically eliminating the opt-out for excluding unrealized gains and losses unavailable for sale securities, and on resolution planning and the extension of the total loss absorbing capacity or TLAC rules to banks and bank holding companies at $100 billion or above, which I think these are good first steps in putting some of these rules back in place that will make regional banks more stable and competitive over the longer term. Second, uh, I, I would also like to see the agencies rethink their approach to mergers. Uh, but here, I'm less concerned regulators are hostile to mergers, but that they just too often see them as the fallback option if other measures uh, around prudential regulation are unsuccessful. I think as we saw in 2008, and we are seeing again with some of these regional banks, the dynamic between mergers and financial, financial stability, is, as Sheila, I think, was observing, doesn't cut in just one direction. You have transactions that stabilize a troubled bank or transa transactions that result in even bigger firms that are destabilized, potentially helping the system in the short term, but increasing your systemic risk over the longer term. 
you know, I was thinking about it, and to my knowledge, I think we've never successfully resolved a bank larger than $100 billion without either a systemic risk determination, some other kind of public assistance, or by making the banking system significantly more concentrated. So I'd really like to see us get to the point that large banks can be resolved successfully through things like breakups, uh, where regional banks can actually bid on those. It doesn't just go to a GSIB without needing to further industry consolidation through these whole bank transactions that are, have been sort of the default uh, in, in these circumstances. I think until we are able to demonstrate we can successfully resolve one of these regional banks, the FDIC, uh, the recent proposal setting a, a simple line of $100 billion over which they're going to uh, subject transactions to enhance scrutiny and presumptions is a reasonable and good start to, to try to address some of these resolution issues. Um, I want to turn to the GSIBs now, and I think some of the points that Sheila had raised, I do think we still have a potential competition problem when it comes to the GSIBs. Last year, we saw them benefit from a flight to safety during the regional banking stress, and I think it's important to, at least as a first step, to interrogate why we think that was. At the time, at least anecdotally, what I was hearing from market participants was that there was still a perception the government will protect those institutions from failure. Um, and I think, as Sheila was rightly noting, that's consistent with the fact that the two types of institutions that particularly experienced inflows last spring were the GSIBs and money market funds, which have both benefit, benefited from explicit and implicit government support over the last 15 or so years. So this suggests to me there is definitely still more work to do to address the too big to fail phenomenon and then the resulting unfair competitive advantages that provide the GSIBs and some of these unregulated shadow banks that compete with other banks. Now, having said that, I think we agree on the on the, on the problem. Um, I I, um, I recall something that Assistant Attorney General Cantor said at last week's Peterson Institute event on bank mergers, which was that the remedy for a lack of competition in the market isn't less competition in the market. And so, you know, to my mind, rather than encouraging further bank industry consolidation as the solution here, I'd like to see the agencies take that GSIB issue head on by, again, making rules even more progressive or using other tools at their disposal if needed to address a too big to fail problem that specifically relates to those GSIBs. And, um, and then I also agree, I think that some kind of deposit insurance reform might help to address some of these competitive issues, dynamics as well. Um, agree, it was remarkable how quickly the window closed on making any changes to the structure of federal deposit insurance last year. And then I'll, I want to make a last point um, on technology. I'm very interested in how technological investments can help smaller banks compete in ways that then help them leverage their advantages with, with relationship lending that I was talking about earlier. Uh, last fall, uh, in my last few months on the job at, at Treasury, I met with nearly 20 different state banking associations. And, and I was interested that I heard a lot of interest from them in how small banks can use new technologies cloud services, other kinds of financial technology um, uh, to, to make them more competitive uh, and to expand their businesses. Uh, but I also heard from them very real barriers uh, that the government could help them navigate in order to adopt some of these services in a responsible way. So uh, I would just say in closing, I'd also like to see policymakers work more with small, mid-sized and regional banks to help them really lean into the markets and products where they have natural advantages over the larger banks. Um, but they just might need some help navigating the tech landscape. Uh, so with that, Nicola, I'll turn it back over to you. Thank you so much. You covered so many different points. So maybe best uh, for me to ask Sheila whether she wants to react to any of these. Yeah, well, I think we are agreeing on most issues. Obviously, the, the point of, of disagreement or, or uh, different perspectives is, is on uh, the wisdom of m &A at the at the regional bank level. I think having you know, handled nearly 400 failures uh, at the FDIC. First of all, we did resolve uh, WAMU uh, and we did sell to JP Morgan Chase. Thank God we did. But there were, there were no other bidders, zero. And uh, it saved us about $40 billion, uh, which would have been the cost of the deposit insurance fund if the, if the bag had had to be liquidated, which was our only uh, option. So the the reason the FDIC, there are good reasons why the FDIC prefers a per, what we call a purchase and assumption resolution. It is because, first of all, it's best for the communities. It's seamless. It's just a change of ownership. You're not breaking off their loans from the deposits. You're not paying off the deposits, making them go to another bank. You're not selling off, you know, their assets to some, you know, distressed asset manager that may or may not be 
very uh, good in customer relationships is certainly the way uh, the bank has. So there are real costs if you break up the bank and liquidate it. I think people get kind of, well, we should just liquidate it. That, that <laughs> That's not a good option from a cost perspective and certainly not from a community perspective. I get, you know, we made uh, J.P. Morgan Chase bigger. It was a $300 billion bank. You know, J.P. Morgan Chase is a couple trillion. So, yeah, we did make it bigger. I don't think we made it more... Um, we didn't reduce the competition. J.P. Morgan Chase was not competitive in that area, and we didn't make it more complex. Uh, the you know, WAMU had a pretty straightforward business model. They took deposits, they made loans. They were making stupid loans, but uh, but that was I don't think we made it, made it more complex. And so I think that's a good example where you do want it in, in, in when there's no other regional bank banking bidding interest for the smaller banks to let the uh, let the big banks come in and bid. But even if you liquidate, you're making somebody bigger. Right. Those deposits have to go someplace else. Those assets have to go someplace else. So so who are you making bigger? Uh, you're, if you're breaking up the bank and selling off the assets, you're, you're making private funds bigger. They're, they're going to be the ones that are going to be bidding on those assets. And again, there are disruptions to the community by doing that. So so the idea that there's this idealized view that you shouldn't use M&A to resolve failed banks. You've got to look at the alternatives and, and the alternatives are not pretty. There, there are tools uh, that can be used, and frankly, I think should have been used in the resolution of SVP that, that you could, that F, the FDIC could have put SVP into a bridge. That the tools are there, the legal authority is there. We've done it before. They could have paid an advanced dividend to, to low those uninsured to help them cover the, the few, I think that was overstated how many need that, needed access for payroll, but the ones that did, you could have paid some advanced dividend to give them some liquidity. Well, you did deal with the bank. And again, you're going to have to do something with the bank. You're going to have to sell it in whole, which would be less disruptive to the customers. You're going to have to break it up and sell it, but you're going to have to sell it to somebody and somebody's going to get bigger. So I, I think you need to look at the alternatives um, in, in suggesting uh, that, you know, we can't let banks get bigger than $100 billion because the FDIC doesn't know how to resolve them. And I got to tell you, I, I, kind of, I know you don't intend it this way at all, Graham, but I've heard some very harsh adverse commentary uh, since the FDIC put out its statement of policy that the FDIC was basically saying it wasn't competent to resolve banks over hundred billion. And that's just nonsense. And I don't think that's, I don't think you're questioning the FDIC's competencies, but I think others are using that argument to, to suggest that somehow the FDIC isn't up to the game. You need decisive, uh, agile leadership, but you have the tools and you need political will too. But, you know, talking about too big to fail, the regulators blank with SVP. I mean, of course, they're going to bail out Citigroup and B of A. They could when we talk about bailouts, we're talking about bailing out the liability holders. That's who gets helped. You know, it's, it's important to break down these these words we use and understand what's going on. The SVB bailout was a bailout. Those who did not have government protection were given government protection. And if you're doing that, with all these billionaire depositors at SVB, we had $200 billion banks saying that's systemic. Well, of course the government's going to say that JP Morgan Chase or City or wherever is systemic. So a lot of this is just the political will. Regulators keep blinking. The tools are there. They need to use the tools. And I think you had the same problem with Credit Suisse. So again, I think we, you know, I think we're, we're, we're in vast agreement on almost everything else, but I think on, on bank failures and the use of MA to resolve troubled banks. You know, when a bank fails or gets into trouble, there are no pretty options. There just aren't. You've got to you've got to choose the one that's that's, you know, least bad. And uh, that's what we did during the great financial crisis. We got through it successfully. And um, and I think, again, the tools are there again. But the FDIC needs the political will and support and decision making to use them. So the Silicon Valley Bank, uh, I cannot resist uh, asking about the, the follow question. Um, you, you said there could have been a bridge bank. So FDIC did create a deposit insurance national bank on the Friday uh, of the bank run. And then it went uh, for yeah. during the Sunday. Well, that was, that was curious. Yeah, well, I'm not talking about a DEMBI. A DEMBI is something that you use when you're going to liquidate the bank. And if, if the, uh, and you know, I read, I have no, I don't talk to them. I don't have any insight. You know, I, I, I'm reading the papers just like you all. I want to make clear on that. When I saw, or there was a leak that they had created a DEMBI, that's usually what you do for liquidation. Now that surprised me. Uh, I, I think a bridge, which is eventually what they did do, a bridge, but but only but only paying an advanced dividend and keeping some of those uninsured deposits back to absorb losses. That's I think 
that would not have been a bailout. And I think that's what should have been done. But a Dimby, I mean, it's important to emphasize if the bank, if, if the FDIC had just liquidated that bank and Graham, you were, you would, you would have been hearing a lot more complaints out in California if they had liquidated, you know, that would have been zero cost. I mean, they only had about 5% or $200 billion banks, a few billion were insured. Of course, the FDIC could have paid those off, sold the assets and, and had zero losses. So and it, it sounds like that was their original thinking. And then they shifted course and, and for whatever reason decided to, to, well, it wasn't their decision. It was the Fed, the Treasury, the president. That's the systemic risk determination is something that a lot of different parties have to sign off on. Uh, but that's, uh, they ended up just, well, we know now that they bailed out the energy. Uh, were you surprised when they announced the DNB, the Deposit Insurance National Bank? I was very sped. Uh, yeah, we never used a DIMB. Again, a DIMB is used for, a DIMB is different from a bridge, and we, yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, but I, yeah, I was DIMBs are usually Grimes, used for, for liquidations. Yeah. I, I was curious about Graham's uh, surprise or like. Oh, I'm own. sorry. Apologies. Apologies. Um, well, we weren't sure the path they were going to go. We weren't surprised that Friday morning. In fact, we, we thought they were going to be closed a lot earlier on Friday morning than they actually were, given the, the, different, the, the difference between East Coast and West Coast time created a lot of challenges. Yeah. On that Friday morning, where 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 the where the East Coast branch is going to open, uh, and then have to be closed down before noon Eastern time, uh, while we waited for for the West Coast operations to be shut down. So you know, I think we were over that weekend dealing with a couple of different dynamics. One was the incoming we were getting from uh, from the customers, members of Congress on this issue that she was talking about about are we going to be able to make payroll? Are we going to have access to all of our funds? Sort of how how are the mechanics? of this going to work. And I do think the, the initial structure that it took um, uh, of having the, the DIMBY did create a little bit of confusion. I think they had to update their FAQs a lot to explain to people what was going on there. I think that there were some real practical challenges in messaging sort of what was happening and how the whole process was gonna play out over that weekend. I think that was one set of issues was sort of getting the incoming from the customers and their representatives about whole, how the whole process is going to work. Were they going to get their funds? Were they going to make payroll? I think where the where the systemic risk exceptions really came into play was once we heard, oh, there are runs happening at other institutions too now because they're worried they're you know we, we, they're worried about haircuts over here. They're pulling their money out of similarly situated institutions. That was when the systemic risk exception really came into play. I'm not you know. Um, I don't want to Monday morning quarterback anything here. I, you know, I feel like no regrets. We we kind of uh, we we, um, we 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 stopped the panic uh, at least eventually. Um, but but I think the concern at the time, at least in my mind, was less about customers getting their money out of SBB specifically and being able to manage those practical challenges, and more about the runs we were seeing in other places and kind of addressing those issues. And so um, that's where the SREs really came into play, and that's where where, where um, you know particularly when we heard. We're going to have to put signature into receivership on Sunday. And there are these other secondary and tertiary sets of institutions we're worried about, too. There are lines outside from those other branches. That's where it really all came back in. That's right. Um, it was a, a long weekend. Um, Sheila, I uh, would like to have your view on something Graham mentioned, which is a uh, uh, so-called uh, Basel Endgame uh, regulatory. Right. Package. Uh, we had a session on this with uh, uh, Stephen Cicchetti and Yao Zeng a couple of uh, months ago. Uh, there's been obviously huge um, vocal lobbying uh, in uh, in that space in the last few months. Um, how do you view this issue of threshold, the 100 billion threshold uh, in total right. assets, and 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 yeah. what's what's your take on uh, on on how to address the trade-offs here? Right. Well, I think. Uh... Look, I think uh, first of all, uh, there. I think you need to separate all this out. So, but the Basel three end game is still vast. The biggest impact by far is with the mega banks. Okay, there there, there are some changes to the regional banks. It does the 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 uh, the Basel three standards go down to hundred billion. I tend to think that that adds complexity uh, to uh, regional banks' capital calculations without really raising their capital. They've got this complex new, they're, so they're getting rid of using internal models to set capital, yay. That should have been done a long time ago. But they're coming up with this new, very complicated set of standardized risk weights and then requiring banks to run the, the, the old standardized that's generally applicable to everybody and the new standardized. I don't understand. And that's not gonna even increase capital to regional banks. So I don't agree with that. I think they should just leave the, 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 the current risk weights 
applicable to the regionals of 100 and 250 billion. There are other things that are being done with as part of or separately. Uh, one is, and I and this actually was not was it 2019 Graham when when Congress passed the Crapo Bill. So this this whole thing of not having to uh, to 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 deduct your losses on available for sale securities against your capital. That didn't have anything to do with that law. <laughs> that goes back to two thousand. That goes back to my tenure. I always supported requiring banks to to recognize against capital their unrealized to deduct from capital their unrealized losses on on their their securities and their and their FS portfolio. So they're changing that. Good. It should have been changed a long time ago. I don't think that would have been a game changer for SVP because again, it was in the whole to maturity of portfolio where the biggest losses were not in AFS. That's being done. That's that's good. So there are also enhanced stress, enhanced stress testing, um, which is more of a Fed thing. But uh, and I think that's good. But again, the stress tests are flawed in their treatment of of government government backed securities, and, and that needs to be fixed. I would say, you know, Graham, it's music to my ears that you want to focus on these bigger banks and having more progressive requirements against them, but. Seriously, I mean, you know, Jay Powell's already said they're backing off on Basel Three. Is that ever going to happen? I mean, it sounds good. I'm with you, but I, I fear, you know, the regional banks are are, are 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 more of a you know an easier target politically. They have much less political power, much less market power. So I think you know it's easier to come down on them like a hammer. And and frankly, nothing is anything going to happen with the big banks. And, and I'm not taking a, a view on this Apple litigation, but I do think it's interesting that to articulate one of the competitive benefits the Justice Department hopes to get out of that is to help the big banks with competition they're facing in payments from these from these tech companies. So I, I don't know if that's good or not. I, I think that's a you know that that's something that'll be considered as as that uh, that litigation unfolds. But I, I guess I'm just more broadly. I just I don't think anything significant is going to be done to reduce the market dominance of the big banks. And I do think you're gonna help them and reduce a lot of competition they currently get from regional banks. I don't mean you, I mean the government generally, if you can, if we continue pursuing uh, these policies. So, you know, I think Tom Honig and I wrote a, a comment letter, uh, probably do that again, when the FDIC first came out with this request for information saying, well, if, you know, if, if, if you want it, if you're worried about consolidation, and, and uh, you know, systemic risk, stability risk for banks getting bigger, just slap a 10% leverage ratio on everybody, right? Anybody over 100 billion, got to have a 10% leverage ratio, but do that for the big banks too. That that will provide a capital constraint against their further growth, and, but you're also setting a higher bar for the regional banks too. And the 10% number is kind of magic if you look at the literature in terms of dramatically reducing the risk of failure. So. I don't think government's going to have the will to do that either. Uh, my fear is on the Basel III endgame, Nicholas, to be to be honest with you, that it's going to end up decreasing the capital requirements of the big banks because they're going to exact their pound of flesh. And at the top of their priority list is to take treasury securities and, 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 and the reserve account balances out of the denominator of the leverage ratio, which will be a huge decrease in their capital requirements if you do that. And I fear that eventually, you know, uh, you know, what's not to like about that? Uh, if you're if you're a Democrat and like big government, well, if you like big government, generally it's just not Democrats anymore. <laughs> you like big government. Give those banks capital incentives to buy all that government debt. Yeah, that sounds good. And you know, the industry wants it. So if you're kind of a pro-industry person, you're gonna like that too. So I, I fear this is this is really where Basel three endgame is gonna end up. Um, um, the weakening um, of capital rules. And we may get some some increases on market risk and operational risk, but they're gonna take a whack on credit risk if you get the leverage ratio in that way. Or I shouldn't say get, but significantly reduce uh, the strength of the leverage ratio that way. And, and and as an observer of European debates, I can say there would be very negative read across to other jurisdictions. No kidding. Well, yeah, I've been there, done that in Europe, right? So yeah, now the Europeans would be uh, quite upset at that, rightfully so. I think that's a that's a, a really terrible idea for, not from safety and soundness of the banking system, but also, just getting banks, you know, going down that slippery slope of having banks essentially monetize your debt for you. Um, that's, you don't want to go there. You really don't want to go there. Graham, um, reactions? Uh, well, I would know one part of the end game package is increasing the, the GSIP capital surcharge. So they're they're right. figuring, they're finding here, ways here. to kind okay. of dial it up for the big banks. Think they're going to do that? You know. Good. <laughs> <laughs> 
That one, I mean, there's been enough other heat on the core, some of the other parts of Endgame. That one, yeah, no, I agree. That's no, that'd be great. Radar, and get rid know? of the so, internal models. That'd be wonderful yeah, if you do that. Yeah. yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, and and it really has perplexed me a little bit uh, the amount of light and heat around what the agencies are proposing because you know they've got these impact statements in there that say this is going to be like a 17, 18 percent increase. Uh, in, in RWA, uh, risk weighted assets and, and, the, and the underlying capital uh, associated with that. But, you know, it, bank balance sheets are not static. I think they're pretty sophisticated at actually managing around some of these rules, particularly the more technical ones. And so I don't think anybody, particularly in the, in the policymaking world, thinks it's actually going to have that much of an impact. The banks will just find the way to manage around these risk weights uh, and kind of lower the expected impact. And so and yet the the rhetoric around this, the the ads about how your groceries are going to get more expensive uh, if you do this is just uh, seems disproportionate to what the actual underlying impact on them is going to look like. And so, you know, I, I, I uh, it's it's been a little bit of a head scratcher the amount of attention this has uh, this has garnered and the amount of pushback it's garnered uh, from the industry in particular when when a lot of the largest firms are, are pretty sophisticated at. Um, and managing around this, but on, on on the point about the the securities and the unrealized losses, you know, talking to the regional firms themselves, there are a number of them still out there that that have that had outstanding issues with that, uh, and that's the part of the proposal that hits some of the regionals the most. And and to a bank, they've all said, look, this is a reasonable change. We will take this. We will take our medicine. We all agree we had issues managing this, uh, and it undermined a little bit of the market confidence in us. And so I think, you know. Um, they all they all seem they all seem content with that part of it to sort of take that piece and kind of move on here. We have a question from uh, one of the participants on um, the federal home loan banks. Um, I expected right. it to come up, <laughs> uh, and the question is: uh, Should the GCIB, the mega banks, no longer have access to advances from the federal home loan banks? Would that give yeah. a benefit to regional and smaller banks, Sheila? Yeah. Well, I, I don't know. I think the whole the federal home loan bank system really needs a, a fundamental rethink. It's, it's become the de facto lender of last resort. I think the Fed's trying to change that uh, now because that's really the Fed's job. Yeah, I mean, I think it just underscores that the flubs have really gone far beyond what the original, you know, congressional intent was in, in creating that system. Um, so that, that may have some merit. But I think there there are more fundamental reforms that need, you know, they need to, they even for the smaller banks, borrowing from them, you know, they're they're really quite profligate lenders. I mean, there's really there's no effective caps on how much they can lend. You know, they should be at least, you know, they should be able to lend more than certain multiple of their capital. Uh, as as the uh, sicker banks uh, borrow from the flubs before they fail, it really dramatically increases the FDIC's. Uh, Resolution costs because again the 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 federal, the, the federal home loan bank has the collateral of uh, the FDIC can access can access it for recoveries. I think they need to look at compensation incentives too. I I was astonished to to learn that at a number of these uh, federal home loan banks, the, the presence of these banks are are paid based on volume. They're actually given economic incentives to to generate volume. That's that's not what their job is. Uh, you know, it, it's not. <laughs> And they're paid a lot of money. <laughs> they're paid a lot of money, those presidents. So I that think, you know, Chinese, what kind of economic uh, incentives? It sounds that, like a piece of the Chinese financial system imported into it. Maybe so. <laughs> no, I hadn't thought about that, but I think you're right. <laughs> anyway, so your short answer is it may have some merit, but I think they're just, there are bigger problems <laughs> with the federal home loan banks than beyond that. Um, Graham, any comment on the federal home loan banks? I'm sure you'll give yeah. it them. Yeah, no, it was it was a big problem with SBB and some of those other regionals. Their um, their desire to go to them as the as the, the first or uh, or least bad option because uh, of the the discounts they get on the borrowing that they do. Like the more borrowing they do, the more equity they get, the more uh, they get they get a refund on that. So it's really subsidized credit for them going there as opposed to the rate they get at the discount window. So it's attractive. Uh, when they're when they can't go from themselves in the market, and then what we saw with some of these regionals was then they just cut them off at a certain point. Um, you know, right when they need the funding the most, they shut them off. The operational issues I think were particularly challenging. Some of those regionals not even having uh, either accounts set up at their local uh, regional reserve bank or even having collateral prepositioned. 
I think that at least the operational part of some of those potential liquidity updates, I think would be really beneficial to get us out of that kind of role we are in uh, with, with uh, moving collateral around between these the lender second to last resort and the lender last resort and the ways in which that exacerbated things. Uh, the super lean, I think this is what she was saying, uh, that, that, that they have in the receiverships and so having to account for that and paying them off. Uh, before anyone else was taken care of, including the depositors, that was a big issue as well. Uh, it was not clear, you know, sort of who was aware of that waterfall and what the implications might be uh, if you actually put some of these banks into receivership. So there were a lot of a lot of challenges in the interplay between the federal home loan banks, the the regional reserve bank, and then the FDIC when they're having to come in and resolve them. It, it seems like uh, the agencies are being attentive, at least to some of those dynamics. Um, I do want to uh, agree with something that Sheila said earlier about those potential liquidity changes. I don't think it makes sense to make pre-positioned collateral the workaround for reforms that need to happen to deposit insurance. Those things, they're supposed to do different things. It's not, um, uh, it can't kind of be this stop, stop gap thing just because there's no political will to take on deposit insurance or whatever else. It's not, it's not going to work. And indeed, we had a session with uh, Andrew Metric earlier this month, who uh, uh, worked in your with you, I think, in your team a couple of months ago uh, in the Treasury last year um, on those liquidity issues. Um, I'd like to go back uh, also to you, Graham, on um, on the point that Sheila commented on on uh, supervision, also the case study of New York Community Bank. I, it's been a surprise to observers, certainly speaking for myself, I don't think I'm alone, uh, to see how prudential supervision in the U.S. was not perhaps as, uh, you know, um, close to the global best practice, let's put it that way, uh, as uh, many of us thought it was. Um, speaking about last year's crisis, but also uh, in the case of the OCC New York community banks more, more, more recently, I mean, what's, what's, it's kind of a naive question, but what happened? How is it that uh, um, prudential supervision of banks in the U.S. Uh, has surprised on the downside so much last year? Yeah, sure. I, I think it's a mix of things. I don't think you have those kinds of issues without several different factors coming into play and all kind of going wrong at the same time. Uh, bank risk management and, and governance being a problem, supervision being a problem, and regulation being a problem all at the same time. Um, you know, Sheila mentioned that that 20, I think it was 18 legislation uh, that was passed. I think that there was a clear kind of shift uh, in at both the agencies, but also coming in from Congress as well, that basically all these other firms could never cause some sort of financial stability issue. Let's really focus on the GSIBs. That's where the problem is. Um, I mean, they, they lightened up on them too, let's be clear. Um, but it really kind of wrote a number of uh, these other institutions out of both the supervisory and regulatory framework um, that had been in place from, from, let's say, 2011 up to 2018. And so I think you kind of pull back on both the regulatory side um, and the supervisory side, and then these risks will just start to bubble up. And, and so I, and I, I think that some of what, to me, you know, imp relying on just on supervision uh, relies on people, human beings, who are flawed and are subject to a whole bunch of different kinds of social pressures to, in these moments, have this kind of will uh, to take some extraordinary steps when you have the bank uh, management pushing back. Maybe you have some of the, the senior leaders in these agencies sort of saying, do we really need to take, take a, a, as hard a line here? Uh, probably pretty hard for a line examiner to really hold their ground when they've got that kind of pressure going on on them. And so I think the interplay between uh, the supervision, but the regulations that are there that are supposed to set some of these lines, when a bank falls below this particular threshold, they've got to start building capital. They've got to have a plan about how they're going to address the liquidity shortfall. I think really seeing... Sorry. Yeah, sorry to interrupt. I mean, it's still puzzling, right? We, we have living memory of the great financial crisis. It was some time ago. There's been, you know, some time to get complacent, but not that long ago, right? I mean, uh, most of the people in charge have lived through the great financial crisis. So I hear you about tone at the top and political, uh, you know, environment and uh, the 2018 uh, legislation, which was bipartisan. Uh, so, but still, I mean, 
they're paid to do a job, uh, right? So, 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 what what exactly explains the, the accumulation of um, of uh, mishaps? Is something that keeps uh, uh, you know intriguing a lot of observers, I guess, certainly me. Yeah, I mean, uh, they're paid to do a particular job, but they report up the chain. Uh, and I, I do think the tone at the top is actually very important in these situations. Again, if you've if you've got uh, executives pushing back on you and sort of saying we're, we're a sophisticated institution we know interest rate risk is a core part of our business we know how to manage it or we understand the culture here in silicon valley better than you do because you're sitting in your office somewhere uh removed from our business um you know when they're being second guessed that way if you've got the the agency leadership uh has your back on that you can push back if they don't if the tone is you know, too many MRAs sitting out there, resolve them, put this stuff to bed, stop stop being so tough on people. I do think that kind of shift matters. And I think um, even with the intervening crisis that happened, I see a real through line in the approach to regulation and supervision that basically banks are large, sophisticated institutions that understand their risks better than the government does uh, and are the best positioned to kind of manage those things. Who are we to second guess? I think there was this sort of interregnum in the in the 11, 2011 to 2017 period of the pendulum switching in a different direction. But that period had a lot of stability, a lot of good growth. I think it is easy, even in that short of a period, to be lulled back into this kind of sense of complacency of, well, we had this one scrape in 2007 to 2009. We've learned our lesson. We'll, we'll tweak the dials of some of these very technical rules up and down. Uh, but fundamentally, nothing about the system really needs to change very much. Yeah, I, I agree on the the political influence. I, that's a that's a that's that's not particular to any party. I, but I, when I got to the FDIC, actually, uh, during the Clinton administration, uh, the FDIC board is includes the five people, uh, the chair, two internal board members, and then the then the head of OCC and the head of OTS which were both political appointees. Anyway, the board had gotten down to three people and, and the head of OCC at the time uh, hijacked the board basically and passed a resolution banning FDIC examiners, banning FDIC examiners from exercising their backup examination authority. And when I got there, I was really trying hard to get my examiners to go back in, even the banks where we weren't the primary regulator, especially with OTS, we're having all these problems with thrifts. And I was a lot of institutional resistance. And they told me this because when they'd done it before, they had gotten completely uh, cut off at the knees uh, by the political appointees on the FDIC board. So I think, you know, I go as far as saying, don't let, you know, if, if, if you're a bank and you got a problem with your examiner, uh, there should be a separate process to appeal that. I, I'm almost to the point where a political appointee just shouldn't be anywhere close to it. If there could be governance, I don't know if Congress could pass something, but I, I had my examiners back. Uh, I, I would get calls. I had an open door policy. I met with people, but I had the examiners there. I had my legal counsel there and we backed our examiners and uh, and they knew that. And I think that's why we were having able to have a more robust examination uh, culture. Uh, I had to build it over time, but we did. But uh, this is a, this is a problem. It's been a problem with both parties. And if you talk to examiners that they will tell you why, that's why they don't they're almost disincentivized to look at the big stuff that they that they, you know the bank really needs to fix, like raising more cap or whatever. So that you get these examination reports, a lot of little stuff makes it look like they're doing their job, but they don't want to antagonize the banks. And and that's that's a that's a very uh, long-standing flaw with the examination process. And we probably need governance reforms within each of these agencies uh, to fix it. So uh, we're getting close to the hour, but I'd like to come back to uh, what you. Uh started with Sheila, which is, you know, the protection of deposits, the transaction accounts. Uh, um, we also saw the systemic risk exemption, of course, uh, last year. So some academics have said, you know, now we, the king is naked. We see that when things come to a, a head uh, deposit, the government prefers to fully uh, protect deposits. So why not make it explicit, have a full guarantee right. of deposits? What's your take on that? Yeah, so I don't I don't support universal deposit insurance, but I have come to the conclusion that zero or very low uh, interest yielding transaction accounts 
should pretty much get unlimited coverage. Uh, I, I don't think there's a lot of, some people say it's hard to, to identify transaction accounts. I, I don't think that's hard. I think if, if you make require that they you know, have 0% or very, very low uh, interest on them, and an examiner can go in and see how that account's being used, you know, or, or, or revenue is going in and out, right? It's not hard to see whether an account's being used as a transaction account. And if it has to be low or zero yielding, you don't need to worry about it being gamed to attract, you know, uh, high yield deposits and, and fund growth. So I, I, I'm I, there. I don't know if uh, we did that on an emergency basis. I think at least the FDIC should be able to reclaim the authority to do that on an emergency basis. And it may well be that it needs to be a permanent change um, to the deposit insurance program. But but no, universal insurance that the weak banks would just pay really high yields, attract a lot of money. The big depositors wouldn't care. The FDIC has got their back and you're going to fund a lot of rapid growth with weak banks. So you, you don't want to do that. Ron? Yeah, uh, in terms of permanent reforms, I think that's right. I think you want to look at the large sort of institutional accounts that are the ones you're most concerned about uh, and are the ones that really, you know, some of these some of these regional institutions really excel at serving those right. kinds of clients. I think that's really, um, if you're worried about both the financial stability issues or safety and soundness and this competitive uh, aspect, that's really where you want them to be able to compete against the large banks that have that sort of implicit support. So I think a targeted change probably makes a lot of sense. On the, on the emergency authorities, I mean, that was a very interesting feeling for me in that moment because I had worked in Congress on Dodd-Frank, uh, and in particular, uh, uh, we had focused a little bit on some of those provisions in there, in both the emergency lending authorities and, and the transaction account guarantees and the debt guarantee uh, programs as well. So I had worked on that in Congress, narrowing those authorities. And then there I was at the Treasury Department wishing we had all these authorities that we could, we could uh, roll out. Uh, it kind of backed up the entire system because we were hearing a lot from mid-sized regional banks uh, that they needed that kind of emergency blanket guarantee at the time. Uh, in the moment, I wanted it very badly. In hindsight, you know, um, we kind of muddled our way through using just the, the SREs for those two specific institutions. And then what I guess I would call a little bit of constructive ambiguity about could we do this again for any institution that failed or not? Uh, how large, uh, you know, kind of sort of message that uh, that uh, the blanket option was there without the blanket option actually being there, right? I mean, those things have to go through Congress now using a joint resolution. Um, what we kind of felt was that absent some really catastrophic incident, there wasn't going to be the will in Congress to actually pass something like that. Uh, and I think at the time, Congress wasn't even necessarily around or in session when some of this stuff was going on. And so um, I had to think more about longer term reforms to those processes or not. Again, uh, maybe it makes sense that you can only do it on a bank by bank basis. I certainly think the political sure. accountability, <laughs> I mean, yeah, it was, again, it was- that I know, but you know, no, so Graham, that is just, it's, it's completely opposite. I think there is a huge perception issue with the, you know, the one-off bailouts, especially Silicon Valley with all those well-connected billionaire depositors being the primary beneficiaries. This is why I always advocated, if you're going to do a bailout, do it system-wide, do it for everybody. And that's what we did with 13.3. Congress went completely, which is the Fed's emergency lending authority, said, let's do it. For, you're going to do it. Open those facilities for everybody, not just Citigroup or whoever. But then Congress went completely the opposite direction without talking with, with me, by the way, and said, OK, we're going to preserve one off bailouts, but we're going to prohibit the FJC from providing system wide support. It still makes no sense to me. <laughs> still, yeah, I don't know. I mean, that's I wish why I said we talked. Think, <laughs> yeah, I mean, that's why I said I want to think about it a little bit more and sort of which way those incentives cut. I, I'm not really sure. Like I said, yeah. uh, in no, the I moment, either. I very much wanted some sort of blanket way uh, for us to just sort of put the whole issue to bed, really stem the bleeding at the time. And who knows, we may have some, some banks may still be around right now. If we had done that, I'm not, I'm right. not totally sure. Well, I, I think that's right, but it's, you know, it's uh, it, it just the path forward. I think we were pretty close alignment in terms of the path forward. I, I'd, I'd go for a permanent fix on transaction accounts, but I do think the FDIC should have some flexibility for system-wide support with all the bells and whistles around systemic exceptions because the resolution authority, the fast track is not really a fast track, as you know, there's no fast track in the yep. house, so it's, it's a yep. problem. Yeah. I would I would just note one, one last thing. The irony is that FDIC got that emergency authority during COVID when there wasn't actually a yeah. run happening. They got they got a there's no controversy. Yeah. 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 Over yeah. that when they didn't actually even need it. And then when I felt like we needed it uh, last year in 2023, 
it didn't feel like that option was on the table. So something something there is not quite right, I think. Okay. It shows how how much we still need to look at what happened last year, and uh, we haven't probably fully drawn all the lessons yet, so we'll come back to it. Um, we're at the hour, unfortunately, so um, thanks so much uh, to our two speakers. The so next session of the series will be on April 11. We'll talk about the venture capital industry in China and venture capital investors from the US and other uh, Western countries uh, in China and the experiences to get these days uh, with Josh Lerner of uh, Harvard Business School and uh, Ray Ma of uh, China Tech Buzz. Uh, thanks so much again to Graham Steele. Thanks so much again to Sheila Bear for enlightening us uh, today and have a great rest of your day. Thank great. you. Thanks. Bye-bye.